Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Speaking Up Influence podcast with virtual business speaker, presentation skills and influence coach, John Ball. Remember to like and subscribe. The Speaking of Influence podcast is uploaded and distributed using Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout makes it really easy to get your podcast started and out to a wide audience with lots of tips and useful tools to help you on your way. If you're interested, check the link in the show notes and start your podcast today. Welcome to the show. Today, I am very happy to be joined by a guest who has a level of expertise that is going to be valuable to anyone who is on LinkedIn and social media and looking to grow their business and to develop themselves and their branding on that platform. Now, he is a podcast host himself. He does professional speaking for his business, and he is even known as Mr. LinkedIn. So let's please have a warm welcome for Mark Williams. Williams. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to, um, I was going to say be the other side of the microphone, um, but um, I'm always this side of the microphone in reality. <laughs> <laughs> it, it on the microphone. other end other end of the stick, so to Other end of the stick, maybe, yeah. Although actually my show, I don't interview that many people. I do occasionally, but uh, it's not an interview show per se. So even that's not entirely true, but it's <laughs> it's really nice to, uh, to be on the show, actually. And I'm looking forward to... Um, hopefully coming up with some interesting stuff that uh, everyone will find useful. Well, I certainly, I certainly look forward to it. I've had a few interesting experiences recently as a guest myself and find that I am really enjoying it, but it is, uh, it is a different experience. Uh, whereas uh, you know, as much as every guest that I have on my show can be a different experience, every host can be a different experience as well. Some people give you a lot of space to answer and some people want to keep the questions coming. It's, uh, it's interesting and right. it's fun as well. It's fun to sort of play with that sort of adaptability and flexibility too. So yeah. Mark, for, for, our, for our audience, t- tell us a little bit more uh, about yourself, what it is you do and how you came to be doing it. So um, 20 years in the recruitment industry, uh, the last 12 of which were running a recruitment business. Um, I was kind of at the forefront of the um, LinkedIn revolution, if we can call it that, uh, back in the day. So I signed up to LinkedIn in 2005. It started in 2003, um, only really because someone that was working for me uh, started using it. And as a paranoid managing director of a recruitment firm, I was like, you're wasting your time. Get on the phone. Um, And he was like, no, no, this is really good. Uh, so I thought I better sign up and check it out just to prove to him that he's wasting his time. <laughs> and uh, here I am all these years later training people to use LinkedIn. So there you go. Um, so in 2008, I, um, I started my own business um, training people to use LinkedIn. And, um, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. So that's almost 12 years, not, not quite because it was December, um, but almost 12 years of, uh, of doing this. And as you can imagine, I've seen an awful lot of change in that time. Well, yeah, I, I, should, I should imagine so. You know, I, I know I've mentioned this before to people, people I've had on the show, but um, LinkedIn, when I first joined, it was really just like a place to my mind anyway, a place to put your online CV. And if you were looking for a job, you might, um, it could be a good possibility for getting headhunted or for being seen. So it wasn't really like it is now where I, or I think it's very active platform now. And there's a lot more going on. There's a, more, there's a better news feed in there. There's more activity, more people 
uh, it's more of a social business, social media than it ever was before. So yeah. what, what, what have you specifically noticed in terms of what, what it has now become to what it was? Yeah, I mean, it's funny really because in many respects, my attraction to the platform was more what we see now. Um, and it was quite a frustrating start for me really because to me, the benefit was that this was an opportunity to network, but really power network um, with so many people from all kinds of different places and not have restrictions of location and time and things like that, that it just seemed to me to be, I mean, there wasn't even a mobile app when I, when I first started. Right. Um, and when there was soon after it was so bad, you wouldn't have even bothered using it. Um, and I, but, it, but it wasn't used like that. You, you're absolutely right. It was used as a recruiting tool, which is a kind of guess how I got into it because I was running a recruitment business. But um, it's changed completely in the way that you say, but only relatively recently, you know, I would say it's it's around about the time of the Microsoft takeover. That, that actually isn't relevant. That's just a date point. Um because, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, Microsoft has taken over and all of a sudden things have got much better at LinkedIn. Well, of course, you know, part of that was they redesigned the user interface to make it more user friendly, mm. fresher, younger, attracting a different audience. And, um, you know, <laughs> I'm no expert on engineering, right? But anybody that knows anything about engineering will tell you, you don't redesign a user interface in two weeks, <laughs> which sure. is basically that assumption would be. Now, obviously a takeover doesn't happen in, uh, in two weeks either, but do you know what I mean? It has nothing to do with Microsoft at all. Um, this is something they've been working on for years. So but there was another a correlation and, than a causation, right? Yeah. 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 But there was also another key factor. And if you remember back, those were the days around that time when Facebook were having all kinds of challenges, the whole Cambridge Analytica thing and da da da, which still, you know, ha is an issue to them today. But still are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But around that time, it was like news to everyone. Everyone was waking up to the idea that evil Facebook type of thing, you know. And, and I think a lot of people thought, mm, I don't know if this is a place really where I want to be building my business. And a lot of people were building their business on Facebook. And it depends on what you do, of course. It's still very relevant to some people. Sure. But also, in those days or prior to those days, you could actually get access to quite a lot of people on Facebook um, if you did the right things. But around that time, they virtually scrapped organic reach. And, and the only way to reach a lot of people on Facebook was to advertise. So it, was a, it became a pay to play platform really for business people. And, um, and at the same, so, that, so a lot of people were going, I can't reach anybody anymore. I'm not sure if I trust these guys anymore. Where else can I go? So you did see an influx of people coming over from Facebook. So that was another significant factor. And the timing of refreshing the UI to make it a little while Facebook in many respects kind of worked for them. And what that did is it brought a new audience um, or new users, really, as well as a new audience. Mm. And these new users were used to social media and used to using it in a much more engaging way. Whereas previously people on LinkedIn had been much more orientated towards I'm in business. So I'm marketing my business. And all they did was talk at you rather than talk with you. This yeah. new, this new kind of demographic came in that were going, Oh, we talk to each other and we post things that aren't always about business, you know? Um, and of course there was a big uproar about that and people going, Oh, it's going like Facebook. It's a terrible place, blah, blah, blah. But but actually, for me, as someone that had been around a long time and studied this platform and seen its weaknesses, it was really good news because people were actually talking for once. And that's when the magic happens, of course. Yeah, and it completely changes the type of interaction or the desire to interact. I think that was one of the things before of like, I didn't bother with LinkedIn so much because it never seemed like there were conversations going on. It never really seemed like there was much to stick around for that unless you were actually looking for someone in a particular sector or um unless you wanted to essentially see people just trying to promote themselves which which for me was more or less like going to going to all these network meetings and networking meetings and playing business card bingo and having everyone trying to um shove their business in your face it's like yeah now it's very different now it's a very interactive yeah. platform but i actually enjoy spending time on probably probably more than Facebook, because although it is sort of pro-social, um, it is not social in the way that perhaps Facebook or you know, Twitter or Instagram is. It's still more on the professional side. Yeah, 
I mean, obviously, it depends on on your network and who you're following and all the rest sure. of it. There's, you, you, people could show plenty of examples that don't reflect that, but <laughs> yeah. um, but I would say on the whole, that's absolutely right. I mean, one thing I would say that that is slightly different to what we've already discussed about that those early days is that there, there was engagement going on, but it was in groups, and um, and and it was effective but effective in the way like a private members club effective. So it's like kind of limited communities and any communication that you had, any engagement that you had was kept within that. Right. So, all right, great. If all the right people are there, but it, you're reliant on people coming and joining the club um, in order for it to be of benefit. Mm. And then of course, groups got overtaken by spam, went downhill rapidly. Um, but that was okay because I think LinkedIn had realized that was happening for a while and they shifted their attention towards the feed. And I think the, I mean, they would never admit this, but you know, I think they, they seriously thought about getting rid of groups. And I think they were they're of a view, well, we'll let them carry on as they are. Um, but actually where we're going to focus our attention is on the feed and get people talking to each other on the feed. Cause like, obviously the feed is just one big community, right? So you can be having engagement and conversations with people that are your followers, but then ultimately through those engagements, their followers and their followers and their followers are able to see it, which of course is what our organic reach is. So hmm. that's far more effective, both for us and also for LinkedIn to be having those conversations in the feed rather than little kind of private members clubs. I, I agree. And yet uh, in terms of marketing, a lot of the strategy that I'm coming across being taught by the people who I'm learning marketing stuff from is around using things like Facebook groups, whereas it seems like LinkedIn groups you can't really use in the same way. Uh, and they they don't, although they've kind of been left there, nothing nothing has been done with them. So it's almost like, in my mind, it almost would be better if they either got rid of them or revamped them, do one or the other, rather than just leave them as sort of like a, um, almost like a, a, a memorial <laughs> to what was on LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a bit harsh. That They have tried. Um, they, they did a big exercise where they did like focus groups and everything. I was involved in a couple and, um, you know, trying to get people's opinion on how to change it. And then they made a big deal of that. And then they did make some changes, but they were relatively sort of tweaking things, not really anything radical. Um, I mean, I would say this because it was my opinion at the time, one I still hold, but I said to them, scrap them, start again from scratch start again to me i don't quite i don't really use facebook so i can't really comment on facebook groups but they are popular i don't quite understand why they work better um if i'm honest for me fundamentally because i have joined facebook groups and tried it but i still have the same problem mm. fundamentally the problem with groups is that the owners of the group's motivation is to grow the group almost always they always want more members right it's kind of like a, a badge of honor to have x number of members right yeah. it was the same on linkedin as well but inevitably as you get bigger it becomes harder to manage and when it becomes hard to manage then you get spam um, and spam is not i don't mean blatant spam like people posting adverts for their business what i mean and this is what happened to linkedin is that people just post articles links to to blogs that they not even their own blog that they think is relevant and interesting to the group so it's well-meaning spam but it's still spam because the equivalent of that is you're at a networking event and you're all sat around the table discussing x whatever that might be right interesting discussion everyone's engaged everyone's enjoying it everyone's involved and then somebody walks in the door with a piece of and you go oh, join in you know we're talking about and they go never mind that have a read of that and then walks out again well you just <laughs> Why? Why would I want to at least tell me what it is or discuss it or ask a question about it? But that's what people did in groups. And I, and I found that personally, my experience of Facebook groups is you get a lot of that as well. And I just find I switch off. This is too much. So I just switch off from it. And people haven't left LinkedIn groups. They're still in them but they don't engage with them or go to them or visit them or do anything with them, you know? So Yeah, I think that's kind of the case of me. And I know I have, I know I still have group memberships on LinkedIn because sometimes when I click on a profile, I say, you are both in this same group. I'm like, oh, I didn't, don't you remember joining it? <laughs> Is that, but yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same. <laughs> completely, <laughs> completely forgotten about that. But yeah. yeah. Um, so, so it's interesting. I mean, it's just one strategy. And much like yourself, I don't really understand why Facebook groups are all that appealing unless there's a lot of benefit uh, and valuable content coming through in that group. 
And uh, I can understand why people still choose to want to be on those kinds of platforms. But why have you specifically focused on LinkedIn? I mean, you, you have more of a background in it anyway, but what, what's the potential you see there over other platforms that they don't have that LinkedIn does? Well, because it's work. So you're talking about pe- people in a professional capacity with a professional head on. Um, they're interested in talking about business. That doesn't mean that you can sell to them, but it does mean that you can talk about business with them and that you can, when you are representing yourself, you are representing yourself in a business environment. Um, I remember a guy who worked for LinkedIn, quite a senior guy at LinkedIn uh, since left, but really good guy. And um, I remember having a conversation with him about this. And I said to him, you know, this is like early days. And of course, LinkedIn's older than Facebook. Um, And I said, you know, what what do you think about Facebook and the challenge from Facebook? And um, and he said to me, the way I look at it is, um, it's a bit like this. He said, imagine that you are um, walking into a hotel on holiday, right? Sorry, you're not on holiday, you're at work. Sorry, I got that right. You're at work, right? You've got a meeting in a hotel, in a lobby, in a hotel, right? With somebody. Um, and uh, you finish your meeting and you're just walking out, you've got your suit on and everything, you know, all dressed up for work. And in the, in the area that you walk past is somebody that you know is a potential client, right? So you're aware of them. You might have met them once or twice, just casually, but not, you know, in business, but not, you're not doing business with them, but you'd like to, you recognize them. They might not recognize you, but it's an opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're sat there. There's an opportunity to go up and introduce yourself and maybe potentially get to know them. Um, now that person is sat there with a briefcase, with their laptop and not necessarily working and just having a cup of coffee. I mean, to be honest, unless you're rushing to get somewhere, it'd be a dereliction of duty really to not go and say hello, right? And just have a chat with them or find some excuse to talk to them. And they were probably mostly likely to receive that quite well. And what he said was, but imagine this exactly the same scenario for you, right? But for them, they're sat there in a t-shirt and shorts with their kids. Now, what are you going to do? Now, how would you feel? Or how do you think they would feel if you started talking to them? Mm. And that's the difference between LinkedIn and Facebook. Right. When you're talking to people on Facebook, the context of it may well be entirely personal. It is for me. I only use Facebook on I don't use it much, but if I do, it's just family and friends, no business at all. And I prefer to keep it that way. Now, that is the advantage of groups because groups are, this is a place where we go to talk about business while we're on Facebook, right? So it, it differentiates and that's how they've got away with that. The other reason I think Facebook groups work is because the feed doesn't work because right? you get no organic reach. So there's no conversations you can have there. Um, so I think that's kind of the combination of things that work for Facebook. And obviously in those days, Facebook didn't have groups um, when, when that guy from LinkedIn explained that to me. But for me, the, the, the context is all right. You know, when I'm having a conversation with someone, they can check me out and they can see what I do, who I am, who I know, who's recommended me. Everything's there for them in an easy to read package, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so as we engage and talk and we can talk about anything you want to talk about, um, they always have that opportunity to start making a judgment of me. And because they've got their business head on, they will be thinking, is this person someone I would want to do business with? Because that's their mindset at that time. Yeah, for sure. One of the things I find um, interesting, maybe the best word I can come up with that isn't rude for LinkedIn, for LinkedIn is um, how many messages, and I know, I know I'm not exclusive in getting this, so there's a bit of building work going on nearby, but um, no, not exclusive in this, but there are um, people who very regularly seem to, drop into my inbox and um, all they're trying to do is get a connection on LinkedIn because they want to sell you something. And and that is something that I don't really get on Facebook or other social media platforms. People, people trying to connect because they just want you to pay for their service or buy their product. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what, well, that's it. Maybe I'm getting a bit less of that now, but that's one of the things I think that LinkedIn does seem to have that other platforms don't but i know it annoys me and i know it annoys a lot of other people is that something you think that they're trying to sort of clamp down on at all uh i mean they've always been trying to clamp down on it it's difficult because um it's it's hard to 
to spot with DMs. I mean, there are certain things with DMs and you, you have the opportunity to report it as spam. Um, you can report an invitation as spam as well. Um, there, there are ways that you can deal with it, but they're very reliant with the amount of members they've got these days. They are very reliant on you um, uh, telling them. I mean, it is, a, it is a challenge because people come to LinkedIn with a kind of marketing mindset. And one of the things I always talk to people about is don't come to LinkedIn with a marketing mindset because you won't get as much out of it. Come to it with a networking mindset. Think about that you are virtually walking into a networking environment and you're chatting with people online and um, and a lot more people than you ever could do in, in a normal environment. And yes, it's difficult in certain ways and there's challenges with it but if you take that mentality to it you'll be so much more successful um but of course people just don't the downside to people having their business head on is that they go linkedin business i need to you know so many clients that i work with and i'm talking about their content and i talk about content that works and they go but none of that's about my business and that just seems completely ridiculous you know i'm here to talk about my business well i know you're here to talk about things that people want to talk about <laughs> but, but, about but, um, yeah. Yeah. But, but i'd say that's the same that's the same concept that should transfer into real life networking as well yeah. really you know one of the things okay. that is one of the worst things to encounter in networking situations which i already alluded to earlier i suppose is, is those people who are just trying to market themselves and uh, and and all they want is your business they're not actually interested in you at all they're yeah. only interested in, in what you can do for them or trying yeah. to get new new followers new clients um but uh, what is the what's the potential for linkedin like especially for people who may be professional speakers coaches trainers along that sort of line what what's the potential there for people like us well, I mean, you know, the first thing I would say about that is that if you're a professional speaker, then it would be the obvious place to check you out. I mean, you know, if I heard about you, came across you anyway, I'm just going to go to your profile, look you up, and I'd expect to see something pretty impressive. Otherwise, you know, what what kind of professional speaker are you if you haven't got a really strong profile, really strong branding in that profile that, that stands out? Um, so that's the first thing, you know, that that however somebody comes across you on LinkedIn or not, the default would be to check you out on LinkedIn, right? So even if you did nothing, um, that would be an important element of it. Because the other side of it is that you have this ability to reach. So if you think about as a speaker, how do you generate business, right? So the vast majority of business I've ever got as a speaker is all referral based. So, but referrals come from anywhere and everywhere. You know, it was like, just somebody that was in an audience once that, you know, um, that saw you speak or even just saw you online um, and then says, you want to get this guy in, he's really good, right? That's so often how it happens. We don't know always who the bookers are because, you know, how do I, it's like in most businesses, you can say, oh, we, you know, we sell software, right? We need the IT director or the CTO. That's our contact point. Speakers, it's like, well, could be the PA to the ND, could be the HR director, could be the marketing director. I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. What you do know is that actually the majority of your business actually comes from people saying that you're really good. But on LinkedIn, you've got this huge worldwide community of people, right, who are all in business, right? And if your target market is people in business, then it's the perfect place to be. It's the perfect place to have a strong profile and the perfect place to be highly active so that you build your brands, more and more people know about it. The secret, it's not really a secret, is it? But the secret to being successful in business is being better known, surely. I mean, it's just it. And it's, it's no more complicated than that. You know, do you want everybody to know who you are? You know, if someone says professional speaker, who do you think of? You know, and that's what you want to be. Now that might be in a niche for sure, but that's what we're trying to achieve. And LinkedIn's an amazing place to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, I say relatively easy. It takes time and effort for sure. Like anything that's worth having, you, you can't just, you know, there's no silver bullet. You can't just press a button and it all of a sudden happens for you. But there is a real opportunity to be better known amongst the communities of people that are most likely to book you and refer you. Yeah. But one, one thing I have to give 
big respect to LinkedIn for is that the amount of help that they give the business owners now in terms of marketing and, and being able to utilize the platform. They have they have a lot. They seem to have teams that are very dedicated to that. And regularly, I find myself being invited to uh, webinars and, uh, and and being sent information that's helping me to, to use the platform better as well. So I think they're doing, they're actually doing a really good job with that. When I started doing um, paid advertising on LinkedIn, um, again, my, my, first, my first paid campaign was a bit of a disaster, but that was mostly because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and then uh, someone from LinkedIn contacted me. They took me through the whole thing. They showed me where I've made mistakes and they showed me how to make the improvements. I was like, wow, that's great. I don't remember getting any of that with Facebook. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was really cool. You mentioned about um, having a good, strong profile. Mm. What would that look like? I mean, how do you know whether you've got a strong profile or not? Well, I guess, you know, um, I mean, obviously LinkedIn do give you a bit of a measurement and in, in the, the kind of top level of that is called All Star, um, which is worth getting, but it's not really the most important thing. The, the, the bottom line is all the things that you would probably expect, really. So, you know, strong profile picture, professionally taken by a professional. If you're a professional speaker and you haven't got a professional photograph, then that doesn't look good. Um, one quick tip on that on LinkedIn, make sure that your profile is sh- profile picture is showing. There's a setting. If you go into your profile picture, um, mobile or desktop, and you actually click into it as if you're going to edit it, you'll see in there, there's actually a privacy setting. It's like a little eye symbol. Mm. Um, if you just click on that, just make sure that it's visible to anyone um, because they change the default setting. And quite often you'll find people and you think, why haven't you got a profile picture? And then you ask them to go, I have. And it's like, oh, well, it's obviously set so that only first tier connections can see it. And that's obviously not what you want, right? So, um, yeah, so it's worth checking that because they changed it about 18 months ago. But so often I find people still got theirs the wrong setting. Um, So that's obvious. Yeah. Um, Background image, um, you know, good branding, um, maybe even a picture of you speaking in front of an audience, something like that. Just strong personal branding in that. That's really important. If you've got a book, you know, an image of the book. Uh, that type of thing. Um, the bit that sits underneath your name called a headline. Um, you know, uh, if you're serious about being a speaker, then you should start with that. Uh, you know, it, there's lots of people out there that like me really that do something else and will do a bit of speaking on the side. If you're serious about being a professional speaker and earning majority of you living that way, then that has to be the start of your headline. And the word speaker should be preceded by however you describe yourself keynote professional international whatever you want right but that when i the headline's important for keywords but it's much more important that it's the thing that i I see your picture i go who's that guy and then i see your name doesn't mean anything to me and then the next bit i see is the headline and that just absolutely seals it right get it that's who you are don't write a sentence i'm not a fan of these helping people with blah 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 right it just wasting words for me that just give it to me in simple bang, bang, bang bullet points. That's all I need to know. Tell me what you specialize in. Right. So speaker and then topics that you speak about. Um, you've got 220 characters, so it's usually enough, but be precise. Well, so uh, the next bit underneath that, you've got the about section, um, which is just above the fold, certainly the first part of it. Start that with a CTA, a call to action. Right? Most people don't do this, but because I don't see all of your about section, um, don't put a call to action, telephone number, email, anything like that in your headline. That's against the rules. You could get your, you know, well, they won't close your profile down, but they'll make your bottom of any search result for the keywords in your headlines. <laughs> uh, don't do that. Um, definitely don't do it in your name either. And also another really bad habit people have got into because they think it's cool is they're putting things like, um, I think it's effective. They're putting things like speaker, you know, keynote speaker in their name field. And the reason for that is that there's a Google thing with that because Google optimizes names on LinkedIn more than anything else. Um, But also, but you know, the reality is, right, if you do a search on Google for keynote speaker, (laughs) it ain't going to be a LinkedIn profile that comes top because people are paying a lot of money for that. People that have probably got, way in excess of the marketing budget that we've got right so um but the other reason is that when you type a name into linkedin um type a keyword into linkedin you'll see in that drop down menu they may appear right they may do but then lots of other people are doing it as well but most importantly it's against the rules if anybody reports your profile just gets shut down for doing it and i know people that have had that so it's just not worth the risk for me um 
but certainly the about section start with the cta the the, the other thing about the about section is your opportunity to say who you are so um the best thing as a speaker is to tell a story. So give people your story about your why, you know, whatever it is that's brought you to this place. That's the story that people are interested in hearing. And they expect it to be good, by the way. They expect that a, a speaker who's good at orating is going to be able to put that into writing. So if you're not, get someone to help you write it. It needs to be authentic, but it, you're finding the right words it can be difficult for some people when writing it. But make sure that looks good. Yeah. There's another section underneath that called featured, which is newish and you might not have it, but if you have got it, absolutely use it. It puts quite large thumbnails underneath your about section. The first one I would suggest, which is the one on desktop, one on the left hand side on mobile, you only actually see one in a bit anyway. Um, that should be your speaker show real video. All right. Well, wherever that's held, YouTube, Vimeo, whatever that should be there. And then the second one, which kind of, uh, shows fully on desktop, but only see a bit of it on um, on mobile. That should be a link to your website, right? To your speaker website. Okay, um, that's how I would, I'd structure that. And then there's lots to a profile, but the only other thing I'll mention that's of great importance, I think, is recommendations. Make sure that your recommendations are focused on what you want, right? So you see people, you know, international speaker, keynote speaker, and you look at the recommendations. They talk about them as you know a chemist or whatever they do right and it's like great but actually what i want to see is someone says i booked john to do da 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 and the audience were absolutely amazed if that, that's what you yeah. want to see um so i mean there is a lot to a profile but if i was to summarize the things that are most important you know no great surprises but they're the things that you need to get right yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, so I, I, I'm already thinking, okay, well, I think I might need to go make a few adjustments into my profile, that's for sure, based on, based on some of the things that you're saying here. Uh, when it comes to recommendations, it's like, yeah, I get exactly what you're saying, but my challenge with them is people will always say, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a recommendation, and then they don't do it. So actually getting people to follow through and give them is the biggest challenge that I have in, in that yeah. particular area. Most people yeah, do suggestions for that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, you'd think we'd have prepared that question because I have a, I have a absolute answer for that, but we haven't prepared that question at all. Um, but uh, this is a really common problem that a lot of people just don't realize about recommendations is that because um, people are almost embarrassed to say 50% of the recommendations I asked for, I don't get, <laughs> I mean, they say they do it, but that's just natural. Look, like, what happens is you go, can you recommend me? And the person goes, yeah, sure. No problem. Um, and then, they go to the they go to LinkedIn and they go, where's the recommend button? They can't see it. So they go, well, I don't know how to do that. So they don't come back to you and go, how do you do that? They just leave it, right? Or they're busy. Now, if they're the right person to recommend you, the more senior, the better, really. Um, chances are they're pretty busy, right? So they just forget. So, or they get distracted. So um, here's the deal. What you do is you ask them in person, first of all. So on the phone, in person, whatever, but you ask them. And you say, hey, um, really appreciate it if you could write me a recommendation. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no problem at all, Mark. Happy to do it. Great. Then you put it in your diary and leave it a week. Okay. After a week, if they haven't done it, go to LinkedIn, go to their profile, click on the more menu. Of course, they'd need to be a first tier connection. They can't recommend you if they're not. But go to the more menu and in there, you will see ask for a recommendation. So don't use that to start with, you see. You need that now as the follow up. So having asked in person and they've said yes, then you click on that. You can personalize the message. So it'll be something on the lines of, um, hi, John, as mentioned, really appreciate your help with this. Because underneath that, LinkedIn put a convenient link. They just click on it and write it. So you've dealt with two things. One, you've reminded them if they forgot. And number two, you've made it easy for them because they don't need to know where it is. It's just that link. Click on it and write it. Right? That increases the amount of recommendations dramatically right people that use that technique get almost double the amount of recommendations that they ask for i'm definitely going to try that i, I like that i didn't have uh, such an effective strategy before so, so i appreciate that i think many people will as well i'm sure i'm not the only person who has trouble getting those recommendations to come through yeah and what what are your thoughts on these um, LinkedIn connection and message bots that uh, sort of find people in your kind of whatever your niches is, are that you're targeting and send out sort of automated messages to them? Yeah, um, I absolutely hate them. <laughs> 
Uh, look, uh, if you want to use an automation bot, um, you are participating in the demise of LinkedIn, full stop. Right? LinkedIn, as it stands at the moment, is a fantastic place to generate business okay, uh, through effective engagement and networking. In effect, you're kind of throwing a grenade into a networking event. And by doing so, people aren't going to come back. Right? They go, I'm not going to that event again because it's dangerous. Right? I don't want to get that. So I'm going to, I'm, I'll go somewhere else. Thank you very much. All those good level contacts that we currently have access to will switch off. They might not leave LinkedIn, but they'll just switch off. You'll never get their attention. So you are contributing to the demise of a platform that is currently very valuable to you. That's why you're on it, right? Now, in a sense, you don't need to worry too much about that because you won't be there anyway, because before LinkedIn's demise, your account will be taken down. And it doesn't matter what system you are using, I tell you now, if it automates invites and messages or either of those, okay, LinkedIn will shut your account down. No warning. You won't get back. You're just gone. Now, I know a guy who had 80,000 followers and was just experimenting with one of these tools, really just to be able to see what it was all about. Closed down, gone. 80,000 followers. Never got it back. Wow. It's, just, it's not worth the risk. But for me, it's, it's a bigger picture than that. It's irresponsible networking. It's irresponsible marketing. It's going, look, I'm just a short termist. I just want a quick win. There's no question that it can work. I mean, all of these tools work. Well, I, don't, I can't say they all work, but a lot of them definitely work because it, they work on the basis of numbers, right? So it's spray and pray. It's let's get out there and hit as many people as we possibly can. And as you rightly said, DMs that are sending you something or invitations that are sending you something or worse, an invitation that isn't sending you anything that is followed up with a message that asks you a question, Right that just kind of like he's trying to entice you. And it's like, it's just, we've seen it. We're not stupid. You know, the audience on LinkedIn are actually reasonably well educated in these things. They're not stupid. They're just going to go. So, you know, it's a numbers game. You know, 95% of people are just going to look up at the ceiling, right? The 5% that's stupid enough to go for it, you think you're winning, but you're not because in time, the 95% will just stop using it. And then all we've got is a network of those 5% of people that actually aren't particularly interesting to us anyway. I got, I got recommended one of these bots by uh, a pre previous guest. And I thought, well, I'll, give it, I'll give it a go. And she said what she was using it for, and it wasn't for sales. It was for purely for connections. So I thought, okay, well, I, I want more. At the time, I wanted more guests on my podcast. I thought, well, okay, let's give it just like, – free trial period let's just give it a try for that reach out to podcasters in a specific area which, which i did so i think you know that was a fairly unthreatening message and stuff like that but what i ended up finding with it and, and the reason why straight away i decided like it wasn't going to be much use for me for anything else and it wasn't even great for that was because some of the stuff that started coming back was like it wasn't really determining connecting me with the right podcast necessarily it was just connecting me with podcasters and uh, so anyone who had podcast in their profile, and it's like, that wasn't necessarily helpful to me. It's like sometimes just connecting with people who just absolutely were not a good fit uh, in either direction uh, for me as a guest or, or to have them as a guest. And that, well, that, that really just shows the thing of uh, what other people have said to me about these, the, these sorts of things for connection tools in the past of not getting a personalized message from somebody, not actually having been found by somebody to say, um, hey, look, I see that you're doing a podcast that's in this kind of area. And uh, I think we could, you know, uh, maybe I'd like to have you as a guest or perhaps I'd like to be a guest, whichever, whichever it is, and, yeah. and make the connection that way. And, and you know, it's, it's not that hard to search for podcasters on LinkedIn yourself and find the people who actually are more in your area or niche who you might want to speak to. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so the whole thing of that is like, yeah, I'm not going to use that again. But it was an interesting experiment. Yeah. I, I, I get the other end of that, you know, I get these messages all the time from people saying they want to be on the show and, um, but they don't offer any particular, just something like, you know, uh, I specialize in it and I've got something great to say. Da, da, da. And I'm like, well, that's not even relevant to my audience, not even remotely relevant to my audience. You're clearly just blasting this out to lots of people. Um, it just doesn't give a good impression at all. Um, so I just don't get why people think that's, well, I know I do get why people think it's attractive because they think that they can be successful on LinkedIn by pressing a button and letting a machine do all of it. And 
And that's easy because, you know, and that word scale comes into it. How on earth can you scale a business if you don't do it? Well, you know, the way you, I don't like the word scale. I, I use the word grow, right? And the way you grow anything is it takes time and you nurture it. And over time it grows. And if you want to be truly successful long-term, then you need to spend time and effort on it. You've got to press buttons and wait for something to happen. If you take that approach, you will get some short-term success. So take the money and run. You know, they're the type of people that will always want to use automation. And the companies that sell it, by the way, they have no risk whatsoever. There is no risk to them. They don't lose their accounts, right? but you lose yours, right? So just steer away from it. It sounds great, all very... The other thing about automation is there's something sexy about it to people. It's like, oh, great, you know, how cool is that? You know, I could just do that and it does this. And so, you, you know, I've been there myself. You can get excited about it. God, it's amazing. It does all this, you know. But actually think about it. You're asking a robot to attend a networking event on your behalf. Ridiculous, right? Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Yeah, there, there are automations that I, I maybe would like to have on LinkedIn. And I don't know perhaps why they don't don't have like with other sites i can automate my content delivery so when i'm posting videos or um, memes or whatever it is i'm posting up um that i can schedule those on other uh, on other platforms but i can't do that with linkedin they don't allow it and and i don't really necessarily get the purpose of that because I, I could you know, if i want that automation in my business i have to you know create hire somebody to to do it for me and just post the content out there and i know someone came someone came from front to me one time and said well it's because you're supposed to be there and interact with people and I, well that isn't necessarily the case anyway many people are, are paying their their assistance or um, a, VA, a va or someone like that to post their content for them because they can't schedule it and i i don't know if that's really beneficial for linkedin not having a system where you can't actually schedule your content to go out i think no i i would i'll be on linkedin side on this one i think scheduling is there's there's a whole variety of issues around scheduling but you can schedule on LinkedIn. You can't schedule within LinkedIn, but you can use third-party tools to schedule content to LinkedIn, and it's not against the rules. So they do allow it, um, but they don't want to get involved in it themselves um, because I think that they feel it will just be an open door to what happened in groups, right? People just posting stuff, posting stuff, no thought behind it, just volume, get it out there. Um, and the problem essentially with scheduling for me is that it appeals to the mindset of somebody that's too busy to network, doesn't want to actually get involved, but wants to just put stuff out there. And essentially it's just noise, right? If a post that you do does not engage, does not get people commenting, then hardly anybody's going to see it. So what's the point in doing it? Well, I see it all the time. I remember years ago, there was a I can't even remember the name of the product. It was one of these ones where you could pay um, to have your article in one of these systems and then people would put it out mainly on Twitter. And I just remember on Twitter getting all these notifications, that, but not, none of it ever did anything. And I didn't get an increase in website traffic. I didn't get anything from it. All I saw was noise, just like Throwing it out there, throwing it out there, throwing it out there. I remember once having this conversation with a marketing manager, quite a large organization. It wasn't a senior marketing manager. but And I said, you know, what you're doing on LinkedIn is you're doing these posts. And you just post after post after post after, but none of them are doing anything. And she went, yeah, but that's my job. I mean, well, surely your job is to promote the business. And the only way you're going to promote the business is by putting something out that actually people see, right? Well, nobody's going to see this. So what's the point in doing it? And she went, but that's my job. That's what I'm measured on. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's just crazy. That make yeah. any sense. So scheduling by the nature of it kind of appeals to people that just want to throw it out there on the yeah. hope that it's going to be seen. But it probably won't be unless you write it in a way that is designed to engage and you're prepared to engage in the same conversation. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I, I personally am looking to engage in the content that I post out, but maybe not immediately after posting it, you know, uh, and quite often I find that LinkedIn actually does a pretty good job of recirculating content that I've put out. So, so some like a video that I posted several weeks ago might still get comments 
weeks later, uh, which I, which I always find kind of interesting, and I don't really get that on other on other platforms. Um, so, but you know, in terms of interactions, like doesn't doesn't mean that I have to interact the moment that something goes out. But I do agree with you that there are many people who I sort of follow who just seem to go for quantity over quality with their posting uh, and don't interact when people do post there as well. Uh, maybe have big enough communities that they get the interaction there. But, you know, very quickly, if I don't get responses from the people I'm interacting with on LinkedIn, I'm not going to bother again with them in the future. I'm going to go to the places where I'm going to get some responsiveness. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Gary Vaynerchuk of this world will schedule posts this chuck them out there they have a team that do it for them and they get a lot of engagement but we can't we shouldn't be measuring ourselves against people with you know tens of millions of followers that's just ludicrous and makes no sense um but in the real world right what we're doing you need to make sure that what you're putting out is engaging and that you are engaging and just to take your point about time delay yes for sure, things travel. Usually a post would last about two weeks on average. You might get three weeks out of it, but normally it's about two on average, But if it's good. But the first hour is critical. Right? Because the way the algorithm works is it is measuring what happens initially to your post. And the amount of comments and replies in that time is critical because what the algorithm is doing is it's going, is this content something that keeps people on LinkedIn? Is it proving to us that it's worth showing to other people? And the only thing they're interested in is, does it keep people on the page, right? So um, if you do a post and when it comes out, you get people immediately in that first hour commenting and you reply to that, there is now a thread and a conversation going on. And that tells LinkedIn and other viewers, by the way, other people that see it, um, that this is something worth a bit of time. This is interesting, something going on here, right? And that's what people are looking for. If yeah. your post doesn't do anything in the first hour, then the chances of it succeeding beyond that is much more limited. It's not impossible, but it's much more limited. I mean, you know, I've had occasions where I've done a post and it's been average. And then four or five days later, it's suddenly got a second life. But when I look back, it's because somebody saw it that was a big influencer. They had a strong following, high relevance to lots of people on LinkedIn that are following them. And as a result of that, that's why it gave it that boost. Right? But you can't, yeah. that's just luck if they happen to see it. So managing it properly is about making sure that you are present at the time that you post it so that you can react to it. Right. So, so that's when we get those nice messages we like to get from LinkedIn saying your post is trending. Yeah. Oh God, no, that's, um, I don't really know how to describe that. It's like, uh, if you ever look at it, you go, Oh, it's cause you've put a hashtag in it. And so you're trending in a hashtag. And then you look at that hashtag and you, you look down all the posts in that hashtag and like yours got three comments and that's more than any other. Well, that's not trending. That's, this is the best post amongst a load of rubbish posts right? <laughs> that recently have used that hashtag means nothing. Right. I'd ignore it. It's nothing to get excited about. Yeah, yeah. When it first I, came I out, I, you <laughs> yeah, I got genuinely about. posting going, I'm, I'm trending in and I'll be like, Oh dear. No, just, that's just LinkedIn falsely trying to make you feel good. Um, yeah, yeah. That's not what it's about. Measure your post by the number of comments that you get. That's, that is by far the most important thing. To yeah, consider. Yeah. So LinkedIn needs to stop massaging our egos with yeah. uh, and, and giving us false hopes that, uh, that our posts are more mm. popular than they are. Because I think nearly every time I've got that indication that your your tr uh, post is trending, is like, go and take a look. Is it? Is it? No, it's not no. at all. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no trend there whatsoever. Uh, but uh, you know, like like you said, the the best posts are the ones where have got uh, a lot of interaction and a lot of following. But that has also created this thing that, uh, that I have, I've only really heard of, I haven't really been a part of it, or these LinkedIn pods. Are you yeah. aware of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, interesting idea that, um, like a lot of good ideas, has been abused, unfortunately. So they've got a really bad reputation now, and rightly so. So I did a couple of episodes about pods, actually, with someone that was um, a founder member of a pod that had, I think, 20 members or 15 to 20 members, something like that, of business professionals that knew each other. Um, they were actually in different parts of the world, but they knew each other. Um, they developed a strong group, strong community, and they helped each other um, by notifying when they posted 
and commented on each other's posts. It was easy to do because they knew that the content would always be good, right? Um, and so they, if they were busy, they'd just like it, but ideally they'd comment on it and they were just helping each other to work with the algorithm because the algorithm, resp- that's the reason why pods exist, by the way, is because of that one hour factor. Um, the problem is that what they became was a lot of, you know, it got picked up by internet marketers basically who thought, oh, this is exactly the same ideas with automation. You know, it's that exciting thing of, hey, we can all help each other. Da, da, da. And what they tend to be is massive, you know, 100, 200 people in a pod, um, very dictatorial. You have to comment on every single post, which is a lot of posts. Um, so when your comment ends up being great post, you know, <laughs> um, so there's not really a conversation, but you're just kind of massaging or trying to manipulate things so that the algorithm pushes it out. And LinkedIn, to deal with that, have brought in dwell time, which is a factor that means that if you comment on somebody's post, let's say they've written a post and that's a three minute read, right? If you comment within three minutes or like within three minutes, it's not completely discounted, but it's largely discounted, right? So the algorithm's clever enough to know you can't have read that, right? which is mean that pods haven't had the same level of success unless people do that. They go to the post and they leave themselves that gap and then they engage with it. It's a shame because in essence, they're a good idea. You know, that the original concept is actually a really good idea of ways of working together to help. And also, you know, if you, I was in a pod in the early days that was more like that. It started more like that than went downhill, which is why I left. But, it, you know, it was very much I was reading content from people that were putting out some really interesting stuff and it was good and it was good quality. And I knew that if I put out good quality stuff, they would put good quality comments on mine and it actually really did work and help. They all had their own audiences that were engaged with their content. As soon as they comment on my stuff, a lot of the, if you've got the right people in a pod, and not too many of them, they've all got high, highly relevant audiences, you know, audiences that are, are listening to them and responding to what they do. So it does have that ability to boost your content. And to me, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's when people take it too far and abuse it, that's when it goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to some degree, I organically have that. Like I have my, my closer circle within LinkedIn who I can more or less rely on to to comment and respond and, and, uh, and like my post. But, but again, I, my hope is they only are liking and responding when there's something that they actually want to like or respond to, yeah. or they might actually come and disagree with me on something. I'm all good with that um, yeah. because it's, it's all having the discussion. But I think you know, that as a natural uh, circumstance on LinkedIn, uh, I think it's probably inevitable. You're going to get your little community in there of people who you more who you interact with more, and I and I certainly do that with with them more as well. I, I'm yeah. more likely to respond and and check out their posts, and and I guess that I'm more likely to see their stuff as well because of doing that. I guess the yeah. algorithms are going to favour me seeing yeah. me seeing their stuff more often than them seeing mine. So um, yeah, in in that respect, I I think that's pretty useful. When done properly, it starts as a notification system that after a while is no longer needed for exactly the reason you said. Because if you're engaging with each other's posts, you're going to see them anyway. Um, The notification system normally continues with them because people aren't always at their desk. But um, the idea is a good idea. Um, But unfortunately, they've just become, you know, just a, a classic kind of numbers game mess, really, similar to automation. Yeah. The, so something I want to ask about, and I, I have asked uh, a few other people about this before in the past, but I have mixed feelings on it still. Um, LinkedIn articles, mm. um, are, is it, are they worthwhile? Do people really bother with them? Or, and, if, and if so, what's the best approach to take with them? The hard thing about articles is getting eyes on them these days. That's the challenge. But you know, the reality is, it depends what you do. But um, on the whole, I would say they are worth doing, but not extensively. So posting would be ideally two to three times a week, article maybe four a year, something like that. The exception to that is um, they're bringing out, they're currently rolling out a new feature called newsletters. And the thing about newsletters is that they are articles that people subscribe to and are notified about, which kind of gets over the issue of um, finding articles because articles are hard to find. The only way you'll find you could do searches 
Um, obviously, when you first do an article, there is a post that promotes it in effect. Um, you can put them in your featured section if you wish. You have to remember to do that every time, though. It doesn't automatically do it like it used to. Um, but they're difficult to get eyes on them. But th the advantage is they have a long shelf life as opposed to a post. And they give you the, the bandwidth to be able to really get across your authority in a subject. And, and a lot of people like reading long form content. You know, um, I would say the trend is towards short form. And I think that increasingly the younger generation are not interested in reading long form on the whole. So uh, that needs to be considered and bared in mind. And LinkedIn has definitely changed from a long form content environment to a short form content environment. It's where all the action is. But there are times when I, I need to know that you really know your stuff and that's kind of hard to get across um, by posting where you're limited to 1300 characters in a text only post. Now though document posts give you a bit more opportunity to say a bit more, but um, they do have their place, but they're certainly not as good as they used to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I do wonder why why LinkedIn don't make it a bit easier to manage them because every time I even want to go and look at articles that I've done or if I've got them in progress and I'm editing them, I have to click on write an article. I haven't got a little articles area to go to. Right. I have to go through this whole weird process just to get into the area where my articles and my uh, my drafts are, are stored as well. And yeah. I, I find that all a bit a bit strange like if they wanted to encourage articles they they could actually have a little bit of an area for for them um but i haven't had great uh, results you know i tried i've tried a few different styles of article writing like a little series or something like that um just haven't had great results or responses from them mm -hmm. and i've also been told before as well not to um not to publish them first on linkedin to publish them and index them on your own website first yeah, there is an argument for that. Um, John Asperian, who I think has been on your show, hasn't he? Um, it was John who said it, yeah. Yeah, yeah very much believes in that. Um, he's better on that kind of SEO stuff than I am. Um, and uh, I believe that's probably the right advice to do it there first and then put it there as well. The, the As I say, the, the bright... The bright thing on the horizon is newsletters. And um, if you get the opportunity to have newsletters, they definitely work because so long as you've already established a reputation. So if people like your posts and are interested in what you've got to say um, and they get the option to subscribe, if they do subscribe, and this is different to following, right? they may already be a follower but not a subscriber. If they subscribe, they will get notifications and they will probably notice those notifications. Um, and they do work in that sense. And I know someone who's been doing newsletters for a while and is getting really good results from them. Um, not massive engagement, because I think the th nature of long form content is it's less engaging because we're consuming the content and we think about it and it makes us think more. And therefore, it's not a conversation in the same way. Um, posts are much more conversational, short hit. You know, what do you think about this? And then we have a chat about it, you know, so you're always going to get more engagement from that type of content, but that type of content will obviously have its limitations by the length of it. So yeah. I think both work. I think you, most of your efforts going to be on posting, um, but you, articles can work and the context of them is, is, you know, just less often, but more in depth. Right. So would newsletters, and I'm going to look out for it. I don't know if I have that feature at the moment or not, but would newsletters be something that they're looking to kind of have for replacing as like the sort of stuff you might do a weekly update to your own list by email? Is it kind of being a substitute for that to a degree? In effect. Yeah, in effect. It's obviously all just on LinkedIn. Right. Um, but yeah, that's the way it works. And um, I don't know whether they're going to roll it out to everyone. Um I don't think they know that yet would be my assessment. Knowing, knowing LinkedIn, how they work, I, I would say they're probably uh, waiting to see what happens because they realize it could be abused. So they're going to kind of just make a judgment on it as they go. You'll know if you've got it. Um, if you just click into anybody's article, if you see someone promoting an article or go into their article, if you see it on the profile, there's a band across the top um, and says, you know, do you want, newsletters and you click on it and off you go i haven't st i've got it but i haven't started it yet i am going to start it this week strangely enough for my podcast so for me my main content is the podcast but obviously there's show notes that go with that so the show notes will be produced leave it a couple of days and then put it in as a newsletter art an article under newsletters um then 
people that subscribe will be notified about it. It's just another way of triggering people to go to the notes and then potentially listen to the podcast. Right. So, so ostensibly it could be something that you, you know, the same content you send out to your email list uh, yeah. on a regular basis that you put it in LinkedIn as well and maybe get a bit of extra reach with it. Yeah, 100%. I, I say for me, it's like one of the disadvantages of podcasts is that not everybody is into them. You know, it's a, it's a form of content that appeals to certain people. And I'm always very aware that there's plenty of other people out there that don't listen to podcasts, but it is my main form of content. So putting something in writing, um, and I have done articles of show notes in the past, but I just never, it just put me off because I was getting nothing. And you just think, what's the, what? it's not worth the effort. Whereas newsletters makes me think maybe it will be worth the effort again. And I think that's, that's the kind of the potential hope on the horizon for articles. For, for uh, people like myself who are content creators and, uh, and speakers and um, looking for brand awareness on, on LinkedIn as well. Um, this might be an important area, but um, who do you, who in LinkedIn do you need to sleep with to get LinkedIn live? And is it worth the bother? Ooh, um, who do you need to sleep with? It, what I would say to you is that there is a, um, have you applied? Uh, yeah, I have, yeah. yeah. And uh, um, still waiting. Recently or? No. Um, okay. Probably Just apply years. again more recently. Um, since the pandemic, they have changed the way they do it, um, partly because I think they felt they needed to let more people have it um, because of the situation. And also, I just think they were struggling to cope with the amount of people that were asking for it. So they've outsourced it, um, which I think has helped the process. And I know people that are getting accepted fairly quickly. When I applied, uh, I got nothing. Um, and I was told to reapply, got nothing. Um, and then I um, interviewed someone on my podcast, actually, uh, from Restream, which is one of the third party uh, partners uh, for LinkedIn Live. Um, and they said to me, apply again. And they told me what I've just told you. They also said that they'd put a word in for me as well. And that may have been the factor, but I do know other people that didn't have that, um, that did get it more quickly. So there's possibility. Now the thing about LinkedIn live is one thing I can tell you is not everybody will get it. it, I, it's not going to be rolled out to everyone. It is only going to be on request. That's the way it's always going to be. Um, and they won't accept everybody. All right. If you've got video content and you've shown on your profile and activity that you produce videos, um, then the chances are you probably will get it. I, I know people who have got really poor quality video content and they have got it. So uh, oh, well, it I'm can happen with a chance then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I got it. So um, uh, the, the second part of the question, is it worth it? Yeah, I, I kind of battled with this one initially because my view on LinkedIn was, look, I know this, I know what the audience is like. I've studied this audience for a long time and just receiving a notification to say someone's gone live when somebody's at work is just not appropriate at all. You're not going to get, you know, a, a business decision maker sat at their desk. They've got LinkedIn on, they're doing other stuff and it flashes up and says, you know, Mark Williams has just gone live. Go, oh, great. You know, but that's not how work is, right? We don't just drop everything to do something. Yeah, on Facebook. Yeah, on Instagram. I get it, right? You know, you, it's fun, right? You're not at work. So it doesn't matter. So I, I didn't think it would work. Um, but then they brought in the way you can combine it with events. And uh, so with events, you can actually schedule it and it goes in people's calendar and they can specifically say, right, that's something I want to look at. I want to see it and I'll put it in my diary, right? And so therefore, it's more likely to happen when people can do it that way. There is, however, a problem. So, so on the back of that, that's why I got LinkedIn Live. And, um, and I thought this could be the answer. And so I did a LinkedIn Live, did a couple actually that way. And um, the problem with them is that, yes, you can schedule it. And yes, people turn up. And I think you get a better audience as a result. But nobody can see the recording of the live unless they signed up. Whereas if you do it unscheduled, I just live, right? Um, yes, I mean, you can do posts saying I'm going to be live and blah, blah, blah. But it, it, anybody can see it afterwards. Now, a big part of your audience are not those people that are live at the time. So there are weaknesses with it. When you look at 
a previously live post on LinkedIn, um, you'll see a lot of comments and you'll think, wow, that's doing really well. I get quite excited. And I want a piece of this. Don't forget, live is not the same as a post. If you see 50 comments in a post, that's a discussion. If you see 50 comments in a live, the vast majority of them are, hi, I'm from Chicago. Hey, great to see you live. This is not a discussion, right? Yeah. The odd question will come up, but there's a lot of chit-chat nothingness in it, right? So don't measure it that way. That's me saying I'm still undecided about them. That, that Initially, I thought no. Then I thought maybe this could work. I've done some, enjoyed them. The interaction was good. Um, but I don't think they're necessarily powerful for organic reach. I think they are a little bit like stories will be when we get those. They're a good way of communicating with an audience that are already following you. So building that relationship further. I wonder then if, if LinkedIn have kind of imagined that people would want to use the event function for things like webinars and uh, where, where they may not want the content to necessarily be online everything they actually want people to turn up live and then it's like okay well, if you've actually shown up for it you can go back and revisit it uh, we'll let you have that privilege but if you don't show up live for it come back and we'll do a lot you know you have to get on your, get yourself on a live in the future maybe yeah. that kind of thinking it's a plausible explanation isn't it i mean it, it's it's classic linkedin not thinking it through to be frank um so which they're very good at <laughs> so you know if that's the case all you need to do is put a button on it that you know do i want this to show previously live or not end of really easy to do but at the moment if you schedule it through events you are going to have a limited audience really just the people that sign up yeah. um if you do it live live um then people won't necessarily turn up because they can't just drop everything at the time right. but then at least people can see it afterwards so the two things equal out and they're not a lot different so what they should do is mean you can event it, schedule it in an event and have it so that you can see it previously live. And if you want to switch that off, then great. If you want to switch it off, then that's that's an ability you've got to do that. Yeah. And, it, and is that available for the person recording it then to be able to um, repurpose it or is it exclusively oh, you can do it on LinkedIn and LinkedIn alone and, and yeah, you can't you can't download it. But um, what I do is um, I, I just um, switch my uh recording on and i record it as i'm doing it yeah so i've got it anyway yeah. um, but you can't do that on linkedin no. yeah yeah it's, it's interesting uh, i mean I, I would love to see a bit more sort of integration not just on linkedin but generally for me there's so many business and professional podcasts around that uh, to see a bit more sort of functionality and promotion of these sorts of areas would be would be great as a as a podcaster what why did you yourself choose uh, choose podcasting as a platform for for you to to grow and reach out to your audience i, I always struggle with writing um when i really put my mind to it i can write um but i never enjoyed the experience particularly and it took me a lot longer than um than than anything else and so what the idea of just being able to talk <laughs> um appealed to me so from a and i always think you can always going to do your best content um through a medium that you're most comfortable with and enjoy most right i think that just if you take away the barrier of this is a chore um into making it something that's really enjoyable you get your content's naturally going to be better right so i think it's important for the audience as well as you but then the other things about podcasting that hugely appeal to me uh, and i'm a big podcast listener myself is that in today's busy world you can genuinely multitask with podcasts so you can keep fit and go for a run and educate yourself at the same time. Um, and that's its big advantage over video, right? Yeah. You can keep someone's attention in a really intimate way. Like you're right in their head, in their earbuds. My episodes are an hour long and I'm talking to them for an hour. I mean, I can't, I can't think of any other medium that gives you that opportunity. You know, it's like, Every week I get to speak to thousands and thousands of people um, in that way. I mean, what else gets near that? You know, so, and what I've found as a result of that is that you get incredible relationship with your audience. You know, they, they really are invested in you. Again, it depends on the type of podcast and how you do it and all the rest of it. But 
in comparison to any other form of content that I've ever done, it, um, it, the, the audience just feel, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you know, I, it's ridiculous really, but I've had situations where I've met people um, and they're a little bit kind of, uh, starstruck, which is ludicrous, right? Because I'm not that famous all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not famous in any way, shape, or form. Oh, I consider myself to be, or want to be, for that matter. But, but they're genuinely like, oh, you know. And it, and it. But that, when that's happened to me, I, you, know, you kind of go away and you think about, oh, that was embarrassing, and then you think about it more, and you think that's just the amazing power of podcasts. It's incredible that you can have that ability to. Yeah. They know your voice. They, they know your personality. They, they really get to know you like they really do know you. You know, that's amazing. Yeah. I, when, I, when I was living in the UK, uh, I used to do uh, regular radio shots. Uh, so I'd get on uh, radio shows, I should say. So I, I, I would have some fairly regular appearances and I, for one radio station, uh, which uh, I don't think is even still around anymore, but um, they they ended up going internet based and then they kind of just disappeared altogether. But uh, I was like their regular life coach and would get you know, going to the studio sometimes and, and uh, actually got a little bit known for that. And I do remember one time going to uh, going to a, a party and, and someone saying, you know, you you sound like uh, you, your voice sounds really familiar. And I said, "Hey, do you listen to this radio show?" And he said, "Yeah." Oh my God, that's you! He said, "Oh, I love listening to you. I love listening to your voice." And like, oh, yeah, that's great. I haven't had that yet with my podcast, but I li- I live in hope. I, I do um, live in hope. Can, can I have a selfie with you? Is like the <laughs> no, you didn't ask that. <laughs> I think I have. A, I think I have a face for a radio and podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, so I live with it. But that, that uh, is the modern day version of an autograph, really, isn't it? Yeah. I yeah, I, I, guess, I guess it is. It, <laughs> um, so you mentioned about becoming known uh, on LinkedIn and like that being a, a marker of success and really one of the keys to, to success as well. In terms of doing that through putting out content and uh, posting on LinkedIn, what works? Like what would be a, a good strategy for a speaker, a coach, a consultant, business, business owner to to get more interaction, responsiveness, more brand awareness through their LinkedIn profile? Yeah, I mean, big subject. But if I was to try and summarize it for you, I would say every time you sit down to create a post, whether that be any type of, there's four different types of posts, right? So you've got video, you've got image, you've got text, you've got document. Whichever type of post you're putting together, your mindset needs to be, I'm trying to start a conversation. I always think that way. I'm trying to start a conversation. So what can I do? What can I say? What can I talk about that's going to get people talking? Otherwise, you're just preaching at people, not going to work. Now, that doesn't mean you always have to ask questions. I'm asking questions is a good technique, but it doesn't mean you always have to ask questions. It may mean that you want to tell a story. People love stories. And they particularly love personal stories. So if you personalize any type of content, it works better. Um, I would say video would be an important thing for a speaker because we need to see you. Um, So developing a relationship by talking head video is very powerful. Um, But I would also utilize text only posts because they do extremely well um, for engagement. Part of the problem with video and document and image is that the viewer focuses on the content that you've put out with text only they own they can only read something and if what they read is encouraging them into a conversation then they're far more likely to engage the danger particularly with image posts you can see an image and go oh yeah move on maybe a like nothing else doesn't really engage as well and video has that disadvantage now if you do it right with video you can get there but you need to think in that video of making it really engaging. And of course it's tempting to not helpful content is also effective, even though it may not appear to be engaging. If it genuinely has an impact on someone where they think this is helping me do my, this is really good, right? Then they will definitely want to comment or like it. The downside is they might reshare it, which is a disaster. You don't want people resharing your content. You can't really ask them not to, but resharing is a whole failure on LinkedIn. It's nothing to do with the algorithm. It's more to do with us, which don't like them for some reason. Um, so don't reshare anybody else's content, comment on it or like it, ideally comment. 
and you really want to try if you're going to put out a helpful video um that's giving people genuine help in their job because they're at work um think about it from the context of i'm putting this out and i want to encourage you to get involved in commenting um in some way as well because that will help the distribution of the post massively so obviously you've got to know your subject and all the rest of it all the kind of basic things that you would expect um but regular um you know you can get away with less in time but initially while you're trying to build a reputation two three times a week is kind of what you should be aiming at um and i would also say avoid promotion initially you, you can get away with promotion once you've got an engaged audience they actually don't mind it and they're actually quite appreciative of it so if you say i've got a webinar coming up you know da, 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 that kind of stuff but don't go on and start doing that straight away when you're trying to build an audience, you've just got to be all about them. You know, loads of value, loads of free stuff, giving them as much help as you possibly can and then very much feel that you've got their back. And then in time, as you build a stronger, more engaged audience, they will appreciate it. Another good thing on content is, as I say, storytelling within a post, but also the whole context of what you're trying to do. Just think about how you can take people through your story so your business and the challenges that you've got um, in that business and be open and authentic and vulnerable, um, not in a manipulative way, just be you. But people that do that really do get a strong audience following. And uh, it's a very good technique. Um, so it's just about letting people in, you know, because anybody that's ever been in sales will know if you want somebody to open up to you, you got to open up to them, you know, and you got to show them that you're open and vulnerable and honest and genuine and through your actions, not through what you say, but, you know, how you say it and the way that you present yourself. And if you do, they'll open up to you. And that's exactly the same online as it is in person. So think about that in terms of how you can bring that into your content. Typically, the type of content that does well on LinkedIn is not always business, 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 but it is always genuine, real, you, authentic, honest, open. That kind of stuff does really, really well. So it's a, it's a good technique to use on all different types. But the easiest way of getting that across is obviously video. Are there any good ways to promote something like your own podcast on LinkedIn? And I've had a few goes and some stuff well most of it doesn't really seem to do a lot to be honest yeah i i was saying uh, i never really got um much from promoting my podcast uh, kind of you get to a point where it's okay people are expecting it's all right um you know most po most recent post i did which was promoting um my podcast uh did really well well reasonably well um but it was very personal so it was i was at the 300th episode and i was talking about you know, what I've been through to get there and what it was like and how surprised I was by it. Da, 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 da. Um, but there's nothing about what the content's going to be particularly. Um, and that worked quite well. But again, it's because I've taken a personal approach to it. So you could do that. But also, if you've got a subject, um, then create a post that is a discussion about that subject, but not about the podcast. You might mention in this week's podcast, I talked to Mark Williams about blah, 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 blah. And it's interesting. One thing that he said was, and, and I thought this and what do you think about, you know, so you're actually creating a discussion around the subject yeah. that the podcast is about. Don't ram it down people's throats, but, but it's implicit within that, that there is some content behind this. Um, one of the things about podcasts is that if you put links in posts, they tend not to work very well. And the reason for that is it's not actually LinkedIn suppressing the post. They used to do that. They don't do that anymore. What it is, is if you put a link in a post, then you're asking the audience to leave LinkedIn, right? That's what you want them to do. But what they're not going to do as a result is come back and engage with your post, right? It just doesn't happen. So you're limiting the distribution of your post by sending people away from it, okay? But the great thing about podcasts, I think anyway, is that you don't actually have to put a link. I know it's kind of optimal to do so, but you don't have to. You can just say, in my case, I just say, you know, if you want to hear more detail on this, then just go to your podcast app of choice and search for LinkedIn Forms. End of, right? They, they're going to bring up the latest episode and off you go. So I tend to do that because it doesn't tell, it doesn't give something 
to click on that takes them away from your post and they're more likely to engage with your post that way. Yeah, I guess the reason why I don't do that is because I tend to think that people like easiness. People are kind of lazy and they're more likely to click on a link than to go and search. Yeah. Uh, in, in my in my opinion. Uh, I, and yeah. I maybe am basing that on what I would be more likely no, no, to you, do perhaps. No, I agree 100%. But, but what you're trying to do is when you write that post, you're, if you think back to what I said before, first piece of advice I give anybody about a post is you're creating a conversation, right? Whereas you're not, what you're doing is you're saying, I want people to go to my podcast. That's my primary reason for doing this. No, your primary reason for doing it is to get people into conversation, right? Now within that, you're going to mention the podcast. And if they're sufficiently interested, having gained this conversation um, to want to go and find out more, they'll go and find it because the motivation is there to do so, right? Well, you're absolutely right. Make it easy for people. They'll click on it and they will, but only people that follow you. It's never going to go to their followers. Now, if they follow you, chances are they probably subscribe to your podcast anyway, or many of them will, right? So you're very limiting your audience by doing that. As soon as you start creating conversations, you get greater reach, right? And if it's sufficiently interesting, people will find your podcast, make it easy for them to find it, but not so easy that they leave the post. Right. Well, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. It would be great to carry on this conversation, but I know I have to respect your time and uh, you've already given us so much really good information today, but we can come and check out your podcast. So, sure. um, so, so tell us a bit more, a little bit more about your podcast and, and the, uh, what it's called and, and what you talk about. So it's LinkedIn forms, which is one word. So LinkedIn forms kind of melding two words, the in at the end of LinkedIn and at the start of informed um uh, so we're easy to find from that perspective um 300 episodes ju- just uh, just about to record 301 today um and basically it's it's not an interview show occasionally interview people as i mentioned before it's me talking about linkedin and you know i talk about linkedin in three sort of ways really so because there are three linkedins as far as i'm concerned there's linkedin the company there's linkedin the website and there's linkedin the community okay so uh, occasionally i'll talk about what's happening at linkedin you know as a company where they're going companies they've acquired uh all that kind of stuff what microsoft think about them blah 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 all that sort of stuff um i talk about linkedin the site a lot lots of changes so you know i keep people informed and say this is change you want to think about this this is the effect it's so one thing there being a ui change but it's another thing saying well what does that mean you know how do we interpret that what can we do to bring that to our advantage that type of thing and then there's links in the community so the community side is things like um we have a, a feature called post of the week so people will nominate a post uh, that they think is really good it has to have a minimum of 50 comments um and then i'll look at that post and we'll analyze it and think why did that work what was good about it etc cetera, etc cetera, which is really useful i think just taking real experience that other people have had um and trying to learn from what other people are doing all the time um that might be bringing users on uh, might be people you know bringing people onto the show who can add value to people who are part of that linkedin community and it's also a general observation of community behavior so you know, we're trying to influence a community um how do they behave you know and things of that nature so they're the kind of stuff that i normally will talk around and about um each show lasts about an hour um as i say mainly me but occasionally other people as well so yeah great i'm definitely going to be adding you to myself you you know your stuff when it comes to linkedin and it's certainly a platform that i want to get better at using and i think you've already given some really good stuff i i know I'm, the first thing i'm going to be doing when we go to this call is going and check taking a look at my linkedin profile and thinking right i need to take all that stuff out that shouldn't be there and, <laughs> <laughs> and make see if i've got this and stuff and, and i know there are things that i wanted to ask you about as well like the video and voice messaging and stuff like that we didn't really get time for but uh may, maybe it's a conversation we can get to have again in the future i hope but sure. uh, i really thank you for everything that you've come come and shared with us today and i certainly hope other people will go and check out your podcast and of course they could come and connect with you and, and find you on linkedin i mean that would be uh, that Indeed. would be an obvious thing to do after listening yeah. to this right uh, yeah. so they can get access to your to your content and your information and to you there as well um one thing i like to ask my guests regularly is for a book recommendation because i love reading i love learning and so what would be uh, if you were going to recommend a book to someone like someone could just say hey mark what's uh, what's a book that i should definitely read that's going to improve 
improve my life or my business or whatever? What would it be? Yeah, um, yeah I'm one of those people that uh, I tend to only read on holiday these days, um, but I do have Audible and listen to books uh, from time to time. I have to say in recent years, nothing's had a massive impact on me. Um, but the one I always used to recommend to people um, is The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. I don't know if you've read that. I, um, I have and I love it, yeah. Yeah, it's just I just think it's easy to read. It's a short read, um, but it really it refreshes your kind of faith in human nature and, and just makes you think about business in a different way and a more kind of a more giving way um and um it's it just the it, to me it's the the opposite of what internet marketing has become you know is that yeah. it's, it's sort of that dirty side of marketing it's throw that away and just be a real good person you know and people buy good people you know and I, that's what i love about it so yeah that's the one i'd pick i, I like it as well i think there's uh, some variants on on it now as well they've got a whole yeah. sort of community and, and follow stuff there they actually send out i really like the content that they send out as well like there's not too many email lists that i subscribe to that i like you know i think oh, i really look forward to the content i get from them from, from them i generally do um, I suppose I should really ask you um, as a finishing up question, uh, what are the podcasts that you subscribe to? Uh, now, you see, it's not going to be a great answer because um, I've moved away from um, learning podcasts, um, which is what I used to do massively, into my podcast habits have become purely sort of pleasure these days. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a big Liverpool fan. and. Um, one of the best podcasts I've ever come across is um, uh, the Anfield Rap, it's called. Now, you know, it wouldn't really mean anything to someone that's not a Liverpool fan, but if you are a studier of podcasts, it's interesting to listen to because they do everything wrong in the sense of, they're better these days, but they literally used to, you know, phones going off. Well, everything that you would say, don't do that on a podcast, they would get wrong, right? In terms of content, though, absolutely brilliant and what i mean is understanding your audience talking in the same language as your audience and talking about stuff that they are genuinely going to be glued to if you can be glued to a podcast right and um and so i've taken a lot of inspiration from what they do even though they're complete not so much these days but were complete dummies in terms of tech and everything else absolutely nail it in that way so that's that's my number one listen um they just it's now a paid service a stack of, some of it's paid yeah. stack of services and things so but a lot of the other ones are all kinds of stuff um varied stuff some health stuff but it's all not businessy these days for me yeah yeah i, I have i have a real eclectic mix of mine and at the moment i'm enjoying some of the new podcast stuff that audible are putting out but of course the audible podcast you have to have an account but uh, there's one on uh, a comedy sci-fi thing listen to called i think it's called high strangers or something like that. it's making me laugh and i'm enjoying it on my commutes to work at the moment but you know the, that's the joy of podcasting there's so much variety of content to choose from yeah yeah no absolutely dramas. have you submitted um, this show for uh, to amazon to Amazon, yes, uh, yeah. but I think if you if you put stuff on Audible, I think you have to be exclusive to Audible. So, but, uh, oh, but Am- okay. Amazon Podcast, I think that's a bit different. So, yeah. uh, so if you want to be on Audible, it's uh, it's kind of exclusive to them, which could be very limiting. Oh, for, I didn't uh, know that because I, I only found out about it recently, and I put mine because it's Amazon Music, I think that it appears on, but it also said Audible. It said if you want to be on Audible and Amazon Music, so I assumed it was both. Yeah. But. No, that I mean, that could for me that could potentially be a, a real benefit. I think it, I could see how it could be a big plus, but it's something I'm still still scoping out, and and I I think they're going more for more established content creators, comedians, right. and performers, and the likes. But but we'll see, we'll see what comes with all of that. Um, so to to wrap things up for today, then just what would be some some final thoughts, a uh, closing thought to leave our audience with. Um, I, I'm going to repeat myself <laughs> because it's such an important thing. Um, go to LinkedIn with a networking mentality and join and start conversations. Talk to people. And um, that's when the magic happens. Great stuff. 
Uh, I think that's a really great thing to, and I'm, I'm certainly going to be embodying that. I think I'm going to stick, uh, put a sticky on my lap, on my computer here to remind me to, to always go and start conversations with my LinkedIn posts. I think that's a really important one and have that take my networking mentality more into LinkedIn than I have done of being that content creator, like look at me, notice my content kind of thing. So yeah, <laughs> so I really appreciate that. Mark, thank you so much for everything yeah. you shared today. It's been a really fun conversation. I, I, had a feeling it was going to be good and it really has been thank you so much good stuff thanks for tuning in i hope you've enjoyed the show remember to like and subscribe and give us a review on apple podcasts or a comment on youtube whilst you're here why not download a free copy of my new ebook the five key beliefs of bulletproof business speakers available on my website presentinfluence.com if you'd like to get in touch with me, send me an email, john at presentinfluence.com or come and find me on email or Twitter and we'd be more than happy to connect. If you think you'd make a great guest for the show or you know someone who would, definitely get in touch. If you'd be interested in having me come and speak or train at your event or your company, definitely get in touch with me. I would love to hear from you. So make sure you tune in again next week where we have more guests coming, more amazing interviews on speaking of influence. See you next time.